certainly took you long enough. Oh, thank you, Sam. Well, do you like them? Like oh. your own? Yeah, I guess so. It's your own hair, I trust. Oh, yes, Sam. When it's brushed out, you'll never know anything happens. Whenever you're ready, uh, Curly. Oh, gee, you like it that well? Yeah, very cute. Well. Yeah. <laughs> the business. So, uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police from Samuel Spade, license number 137596, subject, the bouncing Betty Caper. Uh-huh. Dear Dundee. Uh-huh. It all began on a Wednesday. My, uh, secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, tiptoed into my office and laid an engraved calling card on the desk in front of me. The name on it was Randall Carruthers. He said he looked like money, so I said, show her in. Or him in. She did. Good morning, sir. Do you wish the morning paper? Uh, thanks. I've read it. Dear me. What's the matter? Well, this ashtray, sir. Um, have you a silent butter? I don't even have a noisy one. Oh. In all my years of service, sir, it has been my constant endeavor to keep things neat and tidy, down to the smallest details. I see. Well, if it bothers you, just dump those butts into the wastebasket. Very well, sir. Uh, If you will pardon the presumption, sir, you could use a well-trained servant in this establishment. <laughs> Waste paper baskets clean and empty at all times, never allow refuse to accumulate. That's not a refuse, that's this month's bill. If so I notice, sir. I also notice that you have not opened them. From this I conclude that your services are immediately available. Yeah, and I conclude that in spite of your glad rags and fancy handle, you are somebody's butler. Oh, that is correct, sir. I am first butler in the household of Dr. Mark McGraw. First, yes. Bleak Cliff is the name of the estate. It's near the village of Squid Beach, some 50 miles in a southerly direction on the Pacific coast. You know, I think I'm going to like you as the client, Mr. Carruthers. I mean, it's uh, refreshing to get a few accurate facts without, shall we say, uh, priming the tongue. Oh, thank you, sir. You're thank welcome. You. To continue, not counting the staff, there resided Bleak Cliff three persons. Mm. Dr. McGraw, master of the house since the death of his wife. His stepson, Mr. Anthony McGraw, of whom more later... And Mr. Anthony's sister, Miss Cathy. It is on her behalf that I've come to you, sir. Uh, what is her problem, uh, Mr. Carruthers? Uh, the correct form of address is Carruthers, sir, not Mr. Carruthers. Check. <laughs> yes, thank you, sir. Now, as to Miss Cathy's problem, sir, uh, someone is attempting to murder her. Specifically, she has, upon several occasions, been shot at from ambush. Twice she has awakened in the night to feel the hands of an assailant closing about her throat. And only yesterday, she narrowly escaped death when her motor car went out of control owing to some blackguard tampering with the steering mechanism. And upon numerous other occasions... That's enough. You have convinced me that she indeed has a problem. Uh, What do the local police think? No one has been to the police, sir. Why not? It's a delicate situation, sir. Uh, Miss Carthy's brother, Mr. Tony, is undergoing treatment for um, uh, nervous disorder. Mm -hmm. The family did not wish to place him in an institution, and since Dr. McGraw, his stepfather, is a psychiatrist, he is allowed to remain at home. I see. He's flipped. Uh, Where do I uh, fit in, Carruthers? Uh, Well, sir, if a reputable gentleman such as yourself were to come to Bleakliff and witness these persistent attempts upon that girl's life, uh, perhaps they could be forced to put the boy away where he belongs. It's possible. I'm willing to try. For money. Oh, Splendid, sir. Splendid. I-, I took the liberty of drawing in your favor a draft upon the First National Bank of Squid Bay, one week's remuneration in advance of your services to the Bleak Lipper State in the capacity of chauffeur. I nice. uh, Chauffeur? Uh, yes, sir. I thought that might be a capital disguise. Um, have you a better suggestion, sir? Well, uh... No, no, that's okay. Uh, this check. Yes, sir. Uh, Two hundred bucks. A pretty big weekly salary for a chauffeur, isn't it? Well, you will be allowed to shop for the vegetables, sir. Your cut has been added in. I told him I didn't know one vegetable from another, that I was a lousy driver, and in more time than it takes to tell, I was installed at Bleak Cliff in a room above the garage and told to wait there until summoned. I put on my pro gray uniform with the brass buttons and leather puttees, looked in the mirror, and decided I had missed my calling. But not by much. Nothing happened for nearly an hour, and then I got my first buzz. Yeah, I mean, uh, garage. There is the car, quickly. There's an entrance. Get your motor running. I have the motor in the living room, and it's breaking off. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh. Please, please. Uh, darn it, 
Miss, uh, uh, where's the spark on oh, this? What's the matter with it? Well, it, it's it's uh, flooded the house, you know. And, uh... Oh, it's oh, got the main oh. Down, Chris. Put it down, Chris. Come on. Give it to me. I say, who are you? Haven't you been instructed not to disturb my patient? I'm sorry, I'm new here. When I saw him coming at Miss McGraw with that meat cleaver, I naturally thought. Oh, well, no harm done. Come along, Tony. Come along now. Come along, boy. We'll have a nice long talk. Uh, what shall I do with it? Uh, we'll put it back. You all right? Oh. Sure. I should be used to it by now. By the way, you're new here, aren't you? What's your name? Sam. Sam? That's nice. Uh, turn to the left outside the gate, Sam, and drive straight out to the shore road. Well, if I can just... Uh... Hey, I just turned that little key. Look, Ma, I'm driving. <laughs> Adjusted the rear view mirror so that it showed more of her and less of the rear view. A mile from the house, she ordered me to stop, moved up to the front seat with me, and asked me to drive on. By the time we got to the shore road, she was driving, and I was resting my head on her shoulder. Where are we going? I've got a little hideaway down the coast, right on the beach at the foot of a tall cliff. Hmm. There's a fireplace, a little bar, some records. Got some bot. It's a wonderful day with the surf pounding outside, hidden away from the world. You feel so safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't stop. You like it there. You feel as if there's no one else on earth. Time standing still. Oh, if I could just be sure that Mother wouldn't worry about me. <laughs> You're impossible. Okay, Kathy, I'll be serious. Uh, what's with that brother of yours? Tony? I'd rather not talk about that if you don't mind. Well, uh, maybe I can talk about your stepfather. I really should know what kind of a man my boss is. I go for these drives to forget all that. Please don't spoil it for me. Okay, Kathy, okay. Oh, please. The sharp turn into this driveway. Now, oh. we get out here. Yes, ma'am. Down this path. Uh-oh. What's the matter? Are you afraid of high places? Yeah, you just pushed me off of one. Oh, Sam, don't be like that. You're pouting like a little boy. Come on, I want to show you my little house. What's so special about your little house? Oh, Sam, if you only knew what my life is like. You only know what mine is like. I need someone so much to talk to, Sam. As long as you can steer the conversation, you mean. Come on, Sam, I'll show you the house. The path led to a flight of wooden steps that clung to the face of a sheer cliff. There was something like the stairs you find yourself falling down in nightmares. They dropped maybe 200 feet to a crescent of white sand. Watch out for that one step. It's broken. Yeah. You have to make your dream house this hard to get to? Because of Tony. He has vertigo. What? When we were kids, he used to chase me, and I'd run down here, and he was scared to follow me. Afraid of heights. He still is. Oh. Well, you light us a fire, Sam. The wood's there in the box. I'll go make us a drink. Fire? Who needs a fire? I'm hot. What did you do before you took up driving? Oh, I, I was a private eye for a while. Oh, how exciting. Nah, it's a sour racket. Tell me about it. Nah. Nah, let's talk about you. Here's your drink. Thanks. Well, what do you want to know about me? Oh, me? The scent she was wearing was 20 carat. The story of her life was heavy melodrama. It seemed that Dr. McGraw, a handsome fortune hunter, was a folly of her mother's middle years. But she had come to her senses shortly before she died and cut him out of her will. But that was not the end of it. When Kathy's brother had been faced with the alternative of entering an institution or remaining at home under his stepfather's care, she had begged the doctor to remain in spite of his warnings that her brother might take a notion to kill her. But uh, get this, Dundee, it's real deep. In spite of visible evidence to the contrary, she was convinced that her brother was not out to kill her, but that the doctor was. I couldn't sell myself on that part of the yarn, but she looked so awfully pretty while she was telling him. 
And suddenly she didn't look so pretty. An expression of terror was on her face. Oh. I rolled around to the floor and kicked the lamp out. By the glow of the embers in the fireplace, I could still see the gleam of the gun barrel shoved in through the broken window. I hope he didn't see so much. I knocked over a chair to give him something to shoot at. He was already halfway up the face of the cliff on those rickety wooden stairs. At the top, he turned and looked back. Who was it? It was Mark, wasn't it? The doctor? You know better than that. It was Tony. I thought you told me he was afraid of heights. Couldn't come down those stairs. He never did before. Don't you believe me? Yeah. Yeah, Kathy. I may wind up believing the rest of your story. I took Kathy back to Bleak Cliff and stashed her in my quarters over the garage. Then I went into the main house via the back stairs, found her room, and shook it down. In a cabinet, a bunch of war souvenirs. German helmets, grenades, rifles, and other lethal gadgets. In the desk drawer, I found a letter headed U.S. Army, Office of the Surgeon General. It certified that one Anthony McGraw was unfit for military service. Vertigo. Origin, childhood injury, the middle ear. Downstairs in the library, I found a shelf of medical books. Vertigo. Vertigo was almost incurable, and there was certainly no quick cure. But some patients had lost their symptoms temporarily under hypnotism. Then it said, see narcosynthesis. I did. Speed, uh... I beg pardon, sir. Uh, Mr. Spade. Hey, whatever are you doing in the butler's pantry, sir? Looking for a butler. Namely you, Carruthers. Oh, may I serve you, sir? Yeah. How do I get an interview with Dr. McGraw? Oh, well, sir, I should... Oh. <laughs> Strange, after all my years of service, I I still start as a master of summer. Hey. You did it again. Eh, well, I'm sorry, sir. I'd better see what Dr. McGraw wants. Forget it. I'm answering this one. You're not going to drop your disguise, sir. Why not? Who am I kidding, anyway? You rang, Dr. McGraw? Huh? Oh, I didn't ring for you. I rang for Carruthers. I ordered him to tidy up my office while I was at dinner. And look at it. Looks neat as a pen to me, Doctor. Oh, yes, you're new here. Chauffeur, eh? I'm only wearing his uniform. Here's my card. Oh, Detective, eh? That's right, Doctor. And this one's just about ready to wrap up. Well, you interest me. Uh, go on. I will. I think you've been trying to use that boy as a murder weapon against his sister. Oh. And you call yourself a detective? If you can call yourself a doctor, I guess I can. You've been treating him with narcosynthesis, haven't you? That's right. Hypnotic drug. While he's under it, you brief him on his activities for the day, and he follows through, including assaults with deadly weapons. That would be possible with certain very gestable patients. But I'm afraid impossible to prove. I think I can prove it, Doctor. You shouldn't leave your textbooks lying around loose. I found out the only way Tony could have walked down that stairway to Kathy's beach house without falling would be temporary relief of his symptoms through the hypnotic suggestion, unquote. I see. What do you intend to do about this theory of yours? What do you suggest? You see this row of buzzers here on my desk? Mm -hmm. oh, this one is for my secretary. This is to summon Carruthers, and when I press this buzzer... Two of the most hideous plug uglies you've ever seen will rush into this office, beat you to a pulp, and dump you outside the front gate. That's what I think of your theory. Buzz away, Doctor. I think I like them better than I do you. <laughs> As you wish. From where I was on the other side of the room, I didn't know what had happened at first. All I saw was a lot of paper gushing out of the wastebasket. The Doctor sure was dead. His midsection was perforated like a shower drain. And in the walls, fanning out around the end of the room, about a yard up from the baseboard, there was a straight line of holes. I dug into one. What I took out wasn't a bullet. It was a perfectly round steel ball. Then I remembered the wastebasket, the paper flying out of it just before the explosion. In the bottom of it, I found the answer. The base of a steel mechanism with German lettering on it. It was a wartime anti-personnel mine that the G.I.s called the Bouncing Betty. United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. I didn't wait for the Squid Beach law to arrive. Who could? I went straight back to San Francisco. 
You, Lieutenant Dante, were waiting at my office. Uh, morning, Sam. Hello, Dante. Uh, about that McGraw killing, Sam. Mm-hmm. The chief down at Skid Beach is at cooperate with the department down there at Skid Beach. Squid Beach, Dante. Squid, that's right. They say you caught a bus at Skid Beach. Squid, uh, Squid. That's right. There's a quarter of two in the company of a young woman answering the description of the McGraw girl. Uh-huh. They say that, do they? Uh, they say they got a statement from that butler, Ruzzick, uh... Carruthers. Yeah, well, it's open and shut anyway. The butler hired you, the girl is wanted, and you're hiding her out. Why? Why not? It was established that the girl hated the deceased and bickered with him constantly. The doctor and the boy were pals. That girl's guilty. Have you been able to place her in the murder room? Oh, no, but here's an item. He worked with an army ordinance uh, during the war Mm -hmm. in research. Subject? I made a note of that. Uh, enemy landmines, anti-personnel. One of the reports she helped put out was on the bouncing Betty. Yeah, definitely. Hey, where are you going, Sam? Sam, oh, Sam, it's been so lonesome cooped up here all day. Why didn't you tell me you were with Army Ordnance during the war? I don't know. I suppose I thought it was unfeminine. Try again. All right, I'll tell you the truth. I had a copy of that report with instructions for the operation of the bouncing Betty in the desk in my room. What the devil are you doing with a thing like that? I don't know. I was proud of it. It was the only report I worked on with the general. Should have got rid of it. I did. I burned it in the fireplace as soon as I learned what had killed him. You didn't burn it good enough. Sam, they found it. Yeah. Have they arrested Tony? Not yet, but he's definitely sane. He'll have to take the rap for anything he's done. Let's see. Well... I guess there's no other way. Tony didn't do it, Sam. I did. I want to make a confession. That's a maid, please. After what happened out at the beach, when I knew I was no longer safe anywhere, I realized I had to do it. But Tony said the girl is mine. When we arrived back at the house, I looked into the dining room and I saw Dr. McGraw eating dinner. I knew it was my task to get into his office. Yeah? Then what? Well, the bouncing Betty was in my room. There was some wire in the tool chest, and I knew that two others always went tied to tie up while the doctor was a singer. So I waited until I saw him come out, and then I went in. And I looked around for a place to find it, out of sight. Then I saw the waste basket full of paper. It was a perfect hiding place. The whole thing didn't take more than five minutes. Well, say something. Oh, I say you hate me. Say. I don't. I wish I did. sat there. I held her in my arms until she cried herself out, and we just looked at each other. I knew if I'd put it off another minute, I wouldn't call you at all, Dundee. So, with my arms still around her, I reached for the phone. Homicide. Uh, Lieutenant Dundee, Sam Spade. Lieutenant Dundee. Uh, hello. Hello. Give me that. Lieutenant, this is Catherine McGraw. I wish to make a full confession in the murder of my second. I walked out while she was still talking to you, Dundee. I knew she'd wait for you, and I didn't want to be there when you took her away. As I walked over to my office, everything she'd said kept coming back to me. I could see her sneaking into her brother's room and getting her contraption out of the cabinet. I could see her hiding behind the door until Carruthers came out after tidying up McGraw's office, dumping ashtrays, emptying waste baskets. And that's as far as I got. I went back to my office to wait. And sure enough, 20 minutes after the papers hit the streets with Kathy's confession, the door opened and he came in. Well, sir, I believe it's turning a bit raw out of doors. Gardner was saying only this morning that we should order out some shrouds for the Sepi Glosa Senior after. Uh, am I discommoding you, sir? No, Carruthers, I've been waiting for you. Uh, with your permission, sir, for the ashtray... Just dump it in the wastebasket. Well, I am gratified to note that your secretary has been looking after things and has emptied your waste paper basket. This is right and proper. Quite, quite. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, speaking of waste paper basket... Allow me, Carruthers. You have come to apprise me of your part in the death of the late Dr. McGraw. Am I in error? Uh, you 
already divined my purpose, sir. Yes, it was I who placed that infernal machine. In the wastebasket, Carruthers, yes, I know. It struck me as a bit of poetic justice that the buzzer, which that dreadful man used as a symbol of his despotism, should be the instrument of his own destruction. I'm sorry, Carruthers. I'll do all I can. No need, sir. No need. I'm aware that there is no final justification for taking the law into one's own hands. Every man is entitled to trial by jury of his peers. But where, Mr. Spade, where could be found 12 good men and true who would allow themselves to be called the peer of that monster, Dr. McGraw? Period, and of report. Sam, there must be some mistake. Mistake, Effie? Mistake? Mis- well, well the, the butler can't be guilty. That, that's old-fashioned. It was an old-fashioned butler, sweetheart. Where today can you get help like that? Somebody who empties the ashtrays, keeps the waste paper baskets clean, tidies up around the place. Well, I'd be only too happy to do the same for you, Sam. I know you would, Doc. Considering what happened to Mr. Carruthers' employer, I... Effie, you mustn't allow your mind to dwell on such matters. It's wicked. Sam! Hmm. Who emptied an ashtray in that wastebasket that I just finished cleaning out? Pay it no heed, sweetheart. I'll buy you a silent butler. I'll go tight that up. Hey, I hope I haven't made any mistakes. I'm in such a hurry. Whatever did you do to your hair? Well, I brushed it out, Sam. What happened to the pen curls? I told you, Sam, when it was brushed out, it wouldn't be noticeable. Hours of torture sitting under a hot dryer for something nobody will notice. Oh, but Sam, it, it put bounce in your whole makeup. I get it, the bouncing empty cake. Oh. Hmm, eyeshadow, new shade of lipstick. You look real gone. Oh, no. Whom is it tonight? Well, it, it's a friend of Maude, Sam. Of course, she's not really serious about it, so it's all right. Your conscience bothering you? Oh, no, Sam, no. He, and he's, uh, he's definitely not serious about her. I mean, he... Well, uh... Have fun, sweetheart, while Maud burns. Oh, well, he, he, he won't. Um, I suppose you'll be seeing that girl at, uh, what was her name? Oh, yes, Kathy. Well, at least, that... F, I'm not playing in someone else's garden. No. Well, have fun anyway. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. 